Okay, um, so good morning everybody. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for putting together what I expect will be a very interesting day and for giving me the opportunity to, to speak. Um, so, first off, kind of looking back to what we've learned so far this year about what the, the scope and content of our upcoming negotiations with the EU and other partners may be. I mean, I think as, as everyone in this room will know, we've learned two big things definitively uh, from Theresa May's speech earlier this year. One is that the UK is planning to leave the single market. And the other is that it is almost certainly also planning to leave the EU's customs union. So, I mean, that's, that's going to be the background for a lot of what we talk about um, today. What is much less certain is what exactly the UK is looking for to replace its current arrangements with the EU. Uh, broadly speaking, the government has made noises about trying to look for a kind of broad and deep FTA with the EU that will, to as great an extent as possible, replicate current levels of market integration in, in goods and services. But you know, to as great an extent as possible is doing a lot of work in that sentence. Inevitably, there are going to be a lot, a lot of trade-off the, go the government faces in the negotiations. For example, you know, one clear trade-off is a lot of the quantitative work on the effects of, of Brexit places great importance on what happens to non-tariff barriers between the UK and the EU. A key ingredient in keeping non-tariff barriers low is minimizing regulatory divergence between the UK and the EU. But realistically, what the UK would need to do after leaving the EU to keep regulatory barriers low is probably in most cases mimic EU regulation. Now, whether the government is going to be willing to do it, do that, and whether that's a trade-off it think is, is worth making, uh, we still have very little information about. Right? Likewise, there's been a lot of noise about seeking free trade agreements with non-EU trading partners, and you know, the big prize there would be a, a deep free trade agreement with the US. But exactly how feasible that is and how far the government is willing to go in terms of making concessions to secure such an FTA, we, we don't know very much about. So to set the, the stage for, I think, the discussions we'll be having throughout the day, what I want to do um, in my talk is to introduce and present some research that's been done on the coverage of, of free trade agreements recently by a team at the World Bank. Um, just, just show you some of the key um, findings that come out of the, that research and then use it to think about, you know, what does this tell us about what the UK's objectives should be going forward? Uh, what are the key trade-offs we're likely to face and what, what might we think should be the big picture priorities the government is going to want to have in its, its trade negotiations. Okay, so the work I'm going to be talking about has been done by this team at the World Bank under um, Hoffman, Osnaga and, and Ruta. And what they've done is they've recently released a big new database that they've put together looking at the coverage of all the preferential trade agreements currently in force in the world. Right? So just a brief note on terminology here. In their work, they refer to preferential trade agreements as a term that's kind of a catch-all that covers the full range of traditional free trade agreements, but then also deeper integration agreements such as customs union, the European Economic Area, um, and the EU itself. So it's, it, it's that catch-all term that they're trying to use when they talk about preferential trade agreements. So what do we know about preferential trade agreements? There's 279 that are, are currently in force um, and notified to the WTO. Um, and what they do in this data set is for each of these agreements, they code whether the agreement covers 52 different policy areas. So they're looking at you know, what is the scope of, of different agreements. Okay. So what do they mean by policy areas here? I mean, here are some examples. I'm not going to list them all, but... You know, one would be, does the free trade agreement cover reductions in agricultural tariffs, which obviously is a very controversial area in trade policy because a lot of the progress the WTO has made in reducing tariffs in manufacturing, it hasn't really made in the agricultural area. And then there's things like, do they cover the services market access? Are technical barriers to trade included? What about intellectual property rights? Um, and, and then also kind of some areas which are less obviously related to trade, but which have started to show up in certainly in agreements like the EU, but also in a number of other uh, trade agreements. So issues like do they cover data protection laws? Are there requirements on 
Uh, taxation, either harmonization across countries or countries agreeing binding limits on what tax policies they might impose, and you know, even do, are there kind of cooperation agreements to dealing with, with terrorism in these policy areas. So you know, it's worth bearing in mind that you know, some of these policy areas are clearly core concerns of trade agreements. Others are, are, are more peripheral. The other important limitation of this data set to bear in mind is that it's really simply about the breadth of agreements and not the vertical depth, which is to say they code whether these areas are covered and they code whether there is legally enforceable language that covers these areas. But say within an area such as agricultural tariffs, they won't differentiate based on how deep the cuts in agricultural tariffs under the free trade agreement are. So there's a lot more we could know about PTAs, but this is kind of the, the most comprehensive database that we now have available and which has just become available. So I wanted to highlight some of the findings that come out of this database. All right. So first off, what does this tell us about the preferential trade agreements that the EU is involved in and which we will be uh, leaving following Brexit? Uh, so EU members have uh, 36 preferential trade agreements currently in force, covering trade with 55 countries, plus obviously also the 27 EU member states. So that's a relatively large number of countries that are covered by EU preferential trade agreements. Um, though it's worth noting that if you, if you look at the list of these 55 countries, there's a lot of small island economies in there. And obviously many of the bigger countries, the US, China and India, don't currently have preferential trade agreements with the EU. Uh, if we look at the, the depth of the average EU preferential trade agreement, uh, the average EU PTA covers about half of these policy areas uh, that are in the database, around 25 uh, policy areas. Comparing that to other regions, which we're doing on this chart here, the EU on average has deeper preferential trade agreements than any other region in the world. So the way to read this map is the darker the colour is, the more extensive are the preferential trade agreements negotiated by that region. And you can see the EU countries are the darkest coloured uh, countries here. Also, the US has fairly deep preferential trade agreements, as does Australia and some of the Latin American countries. Africa and Asia typically strike much more limited preferential trade agreements. Why, is the, why does the EU have deeper preferential trade agreements? The action is mainly coming from the fact that the EU itself and the European Economic Area are by far the deepest preferential trade agreements um, in the data set. So we can see that in this graph here, where we're looking for different time periods, looking at trade agreements that were signed during different time periods. So we've got the first half of the 1990s on the left here, up to the uh, more recent period on the right. Um, this little box here is showing the interquartile range, so it's showing where, the most of the, where most of the trade agreements lie, and then plotted up the top here showing much deeper trade agreements, you can see these are mainly EU trade agreements. So for example, if we look in the 1990s, the average trade agreement had just below 10 provisions in it. NAFTA covered just over 20, so you know, NAFTA went much further than most trade agreements at that time. But then the EEA area, uh, which was signed in 1994, covered about 36 of these areas. So it, it was much deeper. Um, and the EU itself is currently coded in their databases covering 42 of the, of the areas, which is the, the maximum observation in the, in the data set. Um, so kind of the first, first big picture thing that comes out of this data set is you know, EU PTAs are relatively deep. The natural thing to then ask is, does the depth of a PTA as measured in this data set, does it matter for trade? Right? Is it the case that as we sign deeper PTAs, they have bigger trade effects? Um, so they look at that. Okay, um, And in particular, this paper by Molabdic, Osnaga, and Ruta estimates a gravity model type specification where they include a variable that looks at what is the depth of the preferential trade agreement. And also, they include an interaction of the depth with is one of the trade partners the UK. Right? So this table here is showing these results, um, both for total trade and then separated into trading goods and trade in services. So two things to note. One is that the effect of depth on trade is you know, consistently positive, relatively large, and highly statistically significant. So there is an association between deeper preferential trade agreements um, and more trade. The other interesting thing, particularly for thinking about the UK, that comes out of this, is 
they look at whether there are kind of UK specific effects, whether depth matters more to the UK than it does to other countries. Right? I think this is a very interesting exercise because one of the criticisms and one of the valid criticisms that has been levied against some of the research that's been done trying to analyze the trade effects of Brexit, um, so for example, the research we did at LSE, is that it was based on average estimates of the effects of EU membership across all EU member states. So it wasn't, the estimates weren't specific to the UK. So what's nice here is they're looking at not just the, the average effects, but also the UK specific effects. Um, and what this is telling us is that for goods trade, there isn't a UK specific effect. But for services trade, debt seems to matter significantly more for the UK than it does for the average other country in the, in the sample. So perhaps this is not too surprising given how important services trade is for the UK, but it's showing that you know, the debt is really important to the UK in services. Using these estimates, the final exercise they then do is say, well, what if we change from our current relations with the EU to other examples of types of preferential trade agreement that are in the data set? How would that affect the UK's trade in goods and in services? So there are three scenarios they consider in this table. Um, the single market scenario, the Norway scenario. Then what happens if we strike the kind of average type of free trade agreement with the EU? And what happens if there's no agreement? Right? And you can see that in all these scenarios, goods and services trades de declines, but the drops are much bigger in the no agreement or the average FTA scenario than in the, the Norway scenario. Right? So this highlights the point that Angus made in his introduction, that sure, we're likely to have a free trade agreement with the EU, but it really matters what's in that free trade agreement. And there is wide scope for different effects depending on how deep the preferential trade agreement is. A couple of final things I want to say. Right, so, so far I've focused on trade with the EU. Right? An obvious question then is, well, if we leave the customs union, the advantage of that is that we can then strike deals outside the customs union. Can they make up for potential lost trade with the EU? So here's some simple calculations that illustrate to what extent that might be possible. For every 1% decline in UK-EU trade, trade with the US would have to increase by 3.7% to make up for the lost trade with the EU. So this gives you a sense of how much of a boost to you, you at trade with the US you would have to be if that's where you seek to make up for lost trade with the EU. If we take the average PTA scenario from the previous slide, what that means is trade with the US would have to grow by 152% to compensate for the loss in trade with the EU that that paper is estimating. Right? My personal opinion is that the estimates in that paper are actually slightly higher than we would like, be likely to see in practice. Our preferred estimate in the work we did at LSE was that uh, leaving the single market and striking a typical FDA would cut trade with the EU by a quarter, which is smaller than their estimate. But this gives a sense of how, how big the potential effects would have to be. Right? If we go beyond just an FTA with the, the US and also strike FTAs with our seven other leading non-EU trade partners, and I think the chances of doing that are pretty low, but even if we did, trade with all those partners would have to increase by 73% to make up for the lost trade with the EU. So you need really big trade effects coming from outside the EU to make up for those losses. Why is that? Well, I mean, it's pretty simple. We trade mostly with the EU. So right here's UK trade in 2014. Half is with the EU. Another 10% is with either EFTA countries or other big countries that the EU has signed a free trade agreement with, so about 60% of total UK trade is covered under EU preferential trade agreements, whereas our next biggest trade partner, the US, only accounts for 13% of trade, and then China, 5%, and all these other countries are relatively small. And if you're starting from a small base, however deep a free trade agreement you sign, the absolute increase in trade is going to be relatively limited. So I am going to manage to keep to my time, which is good. Summing up kind of where I think, you know, useful starting points for the discussion today, and I hope we'll get into a lot more detail during the day. One thing that comes out very clearly of this research and other work that's been done, Monique has done some work which has a very similar message, is that making up for lost trade with the EU by signing FTAs with third countries is a bit of a Herculean task and is unlikely to be to be possible, both because we trade so much with the EU and because the EU is such a deep trade agreement 
currently with such big trade effects that any other type of trade agreement that's possibly on the table with the US is not going to go as far as the EU goes. That's not even under consideration. So what should the UK's priorities be? And I've got a kind of couple of big picture suggestions here. One is that it's more important to maintain existing market access to the EU and to markets that have a PTA with the EU than it is to invest resources in seeking free trade agreements with non-EU partners. To the extent that there is a trade-off between doing those two things, the priority should be on working to maintain existing market access with the EU. And kind of a, a side point here is there's a political logic to leaving the single market in the sense that if you want to control migration and not be under the jurisdiction of the ECJ, you're kind of out of the single market. That same logic doesn't provide any reason for leaving the customs union. I think whether you stay in the customs union or not should be more of a simply what is economically best for the country. I don't see any clear political criterion for why we have to leave the customs union. Right? Now, we can have a debate about whether it's economically sensible to stay in the customs union or not. But despite the decisions that seem to have been made, no one has made a good case for why it is economically in the UK's interest to leave the customs union. Right? And certainly my, my prior would be that it's probably not going to be good for UK trade to leave the customs union. So I think this is an, you know, this is an area where the, the political logic that is guiding, guiding the debate has kind of driven us into a decision which probably should be more of a narrow economic um, decision. And then uh, kind of the final, final point, which is slightly unrelated to what I've been saying so far, but I think it's important to stress is if we do want a deep preferential trade agreement with the EU that does as good a job as possible in maintaining existent market access, there's really no way that's being negotiated before uh, the two-year cutoff of Article 50 kicks in, um, which means some kind of transition agreement is going to be uh, needed. And if I was trying to set the UK government's agenda for the negotiations, the first thing I would want to talk about in trade is ensuring that there will be some kind of transition agreement. Because the closer it gets to the deadline without reaching an agreement, and the more desperate a position the UK is in, the worse deal it's likely to end up getting. So from kind of a game theoretic position, I think it's kind of a no-brainer that the first priority should be uh, looking for a, a transition arrangement. Okay, so I will, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas.